Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the most revolutionary conclusions of Plato's dialogues as a whole, and this dialogue especially, is that not only do poets, or that is artistic creators, not know what they're doing, only do what they do on the basis of some sort of irrational enthusiasm, not possess knowledge about the myriad things that they actually talk about or depict, but even their interpreters, in this case the Greek rhapsodes, but we might think of those who enact those sorts of things, you know, for example, if there's a play that we're putting on, the director, the actors, all those who are putting on the play, none of them actually know the subject matters that they're working with unless they happen to be experts totally independent of their function as artists, as poets or, or interpreters. Now, for the ancient Greeks, that would have been extraordinarily disruptive, extraordinarily revolutionary, because they did look to Homer and Hesiod and many other uh, poets for wisdom, for an understanding about how to do things. They didn't have textbooks for, for everything, although some textbooks were being written, you know, for cooking, for rhetoric, for uh, medicine, for these sorts of things around the time that, that, that Plato is, is himself teaching and talking, um, but there were all these well-developed, we could call them skill sets, bodies of, of knowledge. And those played an important role in things like the Odyssey and the Iliad. So <coughs> you notice I've got this big schema here. In the, the Odyssey and in the Iliad, uh, because they're talking about Homer here, who uh, Ion happens to be a specialist in, you know, there's issues of divination. Divination is, the, is, is a religious function trying to figure out what the will of the gods is. And that's something that comes up at many points in the Odyssey, in the Iliad. They're trying to figure out what do the gods actually want from us, what kind of sacrifices, what kind of prayers, what kind of rituals do we need to do in order to appease them, in order to get them on our side. Um, will our, our ventures be successful or fail? Um, all those sorts of things. Chariot racing. Um, you might say, well, that's not a very important thing. Well, it was for the ancient Greeks, you know, uh, particularly for the ancient, you know, Achaean nobility. They were still into chariots at that time. And we could think of all sorts of other things. For us, it wouldn't be chariot racing. It would probably be automobile driving, you know, equally important. Fishing. Um, we might put in there agriculture. We might put in there all sorts of other things that produce. Um, and there's a lot of discussion of, of strategy or military matters. And Homer ties all of these together in these massive tapestries, uh, which involve a whole bunch of characters. There's plot lines, there's speeches and thoughts that are given by these characters. Homer is <clears throat> really, in many respects, if you've read the Odyssey or the Iliad and you've actually like, given it the time and attention it deserves, uh, an artistic genius. And the ancient Greeks saw that. And don't bother to put comments saying Homer was, you know, just the last of a whole bunch of bards and there was a whole bunch of productions that led up to it. Yeah, we know that. The scholars have, have told us that. But Homer's the one who brought all these things together and for the ancient Greeks they identified it with, with him. So the idea here is that Homer is really a, a brilliant guy and you can learn a lot by by studying him, by reading him, by paying attention to these artistic products, you can learn something about the larger reality that we inhabit. That would mean that the poets would possess wisdom or knowledge of some sort, or understanding. Socrates wants to argue 
and he is arguing this with Ion, that no, in fact, they don't. And one of the questionable starting points that he's going to get Ion to agree to, and probably many readers will agree to as well, is that subject matters are distinct from each other. So there's military matters, and those are something completely different than fishing. There may be analogies you can draw between them, but fishing is fishing, strategy is strategy. Horsemanship is horsemanship, taking care of uh, pigs and raising them for market, whole different skill set. So the idea is that there are no absolutely foundational transfer from one area to another sorts of skills or bodies of knowledge. These are all distinct from each other. Um, and here's where this is going to lead to problems for the poet or for the interpreter of the poet. Homer talks about divination. Now, who is competent to speak about divination? It's the diviner, the person who actually possesses that skill set, that competency, that body of knowledge that has been formed in that discipline. So there's some sort of um, expert, and Homer is kind of like an amateur or a dilettante who doesn't really know that much about it, knows enough about it to say a few things, you know, maybe heard something over here and grabbed a little bit from, you know, this person's uh, practice over here that he observed, but he doesn't really know anything about divination as such. Homer is not a diviner. He's a poet. Um, what about chariot racing? Did Homer race chariots? Did he learn how to race chariots? Well, Socrates doesn't think that he did, and neither does Ion. Um, <clears throat> if Homer actually has anything to contribute, uh, as far as knowledge goes, speaking well about chariot racing, uh, he has it only insofar as he was himself a chariot racer or studied it in, you know, the chariot racing school of Ionia or something like that. But that wasn't the case, so he actually doesn't know anything about it and can't tell us anything very useful about it. And we can do the same thing going through all these different sets of skills. You see where this is going. Sooner or later, the poet is having stripped away from him any sort of competency except in, say, creating poetry. And it turns out that poetry doesn't communicate knowledge about anything, and the interpreter isn't able to make the poem speak with knowledge about anything. They're able to get the audience riled up and interested and have them, you know, feel horror and shock and anger and joy and stuff like that. But that's just playing on people's emotions. That's not actually communicating knowledge to them. It can entertain, but it cannot inform or teach. I leave this one for last, strategy. Why? Because after all the other ones have been stripped away, Ion is still saying, well, you know, at least Homer can tell us about this. And Socrates says, well, that's really interesting because, you know, everybody needs generals. So, Ion, why aren't you in military command right now? And Ion says, well, you know, my city's been conquered by you Athenians, so there's really <clears throat> no need for, for me to be a general. And Socrates says, you know, that actually doesn't, doesn't hold up. Because, you know, the Athenians hired this guy, and they hired this guy, and they're foreigners. As a matter of fact, if you actually possess, and you can show people that you possess military knowledge, I'll bet you they'll give you a command. And Ion has to say, well, I guess I don't actually, and Homer doesn't actually have military science or strategy. So what does this leave us with? Does the poet actually know anything? It appears that the poet doesn't. This is where, and there's, there's that other uh, core concept video that you can look at about the metaphor of the rings. Um, if the poet is actually able to communicate anything that turns out to be right opinion, that is, that turns out to be a belief that is in line with, with what's true, that could, you know, sort of imitate these, 
subject matters, uh, these, these areas of competence, it's only because the gods have you know, spoken through the poet. They've given the poet some sort of supernatural advantage, and so the poet, without even realizing what he's doing, you know, communicates that. The rhapsode does the same thing, just like the iron rings uh, communicating the magnetic force from the magnet. If that's the case, <coughs> then the implication is that one very important sector of ancient Greek society, where people were making claims to knowledge, doesn't have any knowledge at all, doesn't communicate any sort of wisdom, really has... <clears throat> nothing of any true value to say on any of the important topics ranging from how we ought to comport ourselves in relation to the gods, how we ought to procure our food, how we ought to drive our vehicles, how we ought to make war and make peace. This would be extremely revolutionary to say. And this sort of looks forward to why, in fact, the poets are some of the people who are prosecuting Socrates at his trial in, in the Apology. Is this the last word that, that ought to be said about this? No, there's, there's actually something fundamentally wrong with Socrates' assumption that he gets Ion to buy into, because Ion doesn't know any better, that subject matters, the subject matters that particular arts, skills, crafts, disciplines, sciences bear upon, must be totally distinct from each other, and that there can't be any overlap. It may be that poetry at least for certain poets, not, not the run-of-the-mill poets, but certain you know, great poets like, like Homer, or think about Shakespeare, for example, maybe they do, in fact, have some sort of knowledge, but it's knowledge of a different sort than these disciplinary types of knowledge. That's an open question that we have to uh, leave at, at this time and not try to resolve, because <clears throat> there isn't any resolution for it. It's just something that's being suggested by the way that this dialogue works out. The bottom line is that for Plato, consistently through, through his works, although there are some tensions here, the answer to this to the poets possess knowledge is no. 